everyone i hope am i am i am i audible can anyone please confirm that once please uh, yes you are audible okay sure thank you uh, yeah okay. so uh, i'll take questions from chat first and then we'll go over the topic for for today uh, so there is this question i think raised by nair uh, it says uh, can you please explain symbolic execution and dart with other examples than the ones given in slide so uh, uh, in which portion uh, nair are you having difficulty specifically would you mind telling me that uh if possible we can cover uh while we are discussing that topic specifically Maybe right? Abhinav, you can take a old paper mm -hmm. so where we are having a question on symbolic execution so one thing is like what is the uh the particular constraint uh we need to go for a condition such that will reach a particular statement that is one way mm. then right, a right. split happens in a condition so what are the splits happening Possible hmm. condition that that those two things are fine, I think, and loops, yes. right? Loops, yeah, right. So, I think that is uh, covering for most of it. So, I think it'll be fine. Uh, we can have that. Uh, all right, yeah, sure. Now we'll we'll uh, discuss that when we get there. Okay. And the other question is uh, regarding GA five. Uh, so, uh, which doubt it is? I mean, like you can go ahead uh, and ask Janani, right? Yeah, like. I have a doubt in the um, nine questions. Like um, for uh, GECC, it's like general active clause coverage, right? So in uh, question number seven, I gave the answer as one three and one four, but the correct answer was one three alone. Can you explain why it's only one three? Because there is no okay. restrictions in GECC, right? Like we can yeah. cover um, like. In, in, there is no restriction on the minor class should be like this or not. Afnan, you can just open. I think uh, the another one that's that's not a determinant as I can remember that question. <laughs> okay, okay. Let me yeah, let yeah. me open that. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll just share my screen opening that question. Only one case that uh, A is becoming determinant. In another case, it's not determinant. I think I've seen the oh. question, but please recheck it. Okay. Okay. Oh uh, yeah. Please let me know if the screen is coming up now yeah all right so this is week five ga i hope the deadline is over yes it yeah, is yeah. uh yeah which question um question number seven okay this one is it yeah yeah all right let me go over the question once please uh okay we have the truth table uh it's asking for gacc Right, so what's the answer? One three, right? Yeah. Uh, one three is A is true. This is why A is it? Uh, 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 no, but what's the major clause? Yeah, A is the major clause, right? As mentioned yeah. here, so that'll be one three and true false, and it is actually so for it to determine basically B has to be false, uh, which means two. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I think I'm correct. Uh, you can solve it on a two or something. This one, one three, right? Because it has to be true. B needs to be true. That is the P yeah. sub A, it's right? The class, okay. Yeah. So then it is one, and A is false three, right? So I mean that is all. I don't see. So, uh, like, uh, my uh, doubt is, like, in general active clause coverage, if A is going to be the major clause, whatever value A is assuming should be the resultant, right? Like, if A is going to... that's, that's fine. That's not a problem. You can take any values, but the problem is... No, I think your voice is breaking. Would you mind uh, repeating your question once again, please? Possible? You are not audible. Hello? Yeah. Uh, am I uh, like I got uh, it is still uh, breaking? Discussed. Yes, the audio is breaking. Sorry, it is still breaking. 
आपने ने बेटर सॉल्व इट ऑन अ नोटपैड नो जस्ट अ हैंड डोंट टेक मच टाइम जस्ट या फॉर यू नो नो दैट इज व्हाट आई डू सो नो आई थिंक आई नीड अ कंफ्यूजन इफ आई एम अंडरस्टैंड द डिटरमिनेंट थिंग या 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 दैट इज सो इफ यू राइट दिस पी ए नो साइमल्टेनियसली सो यू विल अंडरस्टैंड या या ट्रू ट्रू सर basically we needs to be true you know in the both both the cases so it happens in this case that the pairs are actually same you know uh, the gscc pair is actually equal to the the racc pair also and therefore uh, it is matching but in general it need not be the case yes yeah, so, i mean that is the thing uh, if you wish i can solve it also uh yeah let me let me take that one so i'll just uh, do that Abnan, it's okay. Maybe you can continue another thing. I'll solve it in a paper. I'll send it. Oh yeah, you have that right, sir. Uh, writing. Uh, it's right. okay. Yeah, yeah. It's just a hand, right? I'll do it in a paper. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, if you can do that, we can I'll demonstrate. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, sir. All right. So for now, we'll go forward because uh, um, I think I got the question. But if in case uh, it is not clear, you may ask again, and and we'll be able to clear that up. For now, we'll we'll go on with the other things. uh all right let me start sharing again so i think now i can go with the symbolic execution part if nobody else has any other questions let me share that once again yeah please let me know if the slide is visible now on the screen Yes, it's visible. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Anand. So this is uh, week seven. Uh, it talks about symbolic testing mostly, and the uh, the things that are following up after this is going to be build building upon uh, these concepts that are being discussed here, including uh, Dart. So it will be better if we are clear with the uh, the the general idea of what symbolic testing is all about, uh, and you know the rest of the material will basically be very easy then to understand. okay so so uh, i'll go over the definition first and then kind of try to elaborate on that so it says uh, symbolic execution a means of analyzing a given program to determine what inputs cause each part of the program to execute okay so recall uh, in the the general methodology that we have for testing right the test cases we have to write ourselves now for a particular input some execution path for the program will be followed okay and and for some other other inputs it might cause uh, the program to take other paths you know in the think of it uh, as a cfg right so you have a cfg and depending on the input a program may take one path or, an, or an, another path right so it all depends on whatever input we are giving to the program so in this case however so it it was all like you know it depends on the test case now we are ourselves are making test case so how do we actually determine what input is causing what part of the program to get executed okay so that is something that we don't know in advance right so this is one way to go about it symbolic execution and it is specifically uh, you know uh, for the conditions the conditional statements the if statements that are there because the branching basically you know happens only in, in the condition is there so if a condition is there then only you have a juncture from where you can take another path because if if there are no condition then that becomes a more or less a linear program in that case it is all going to execute you know sequentially but if you have conditions or loops or things like that then in that case it may vary the path may vary depending on the conditions that are there so symbolic execution is mostly concerned on those aspects like what conditions what inputs precisely are going to trigger what set of uh, execution paths for the program so that is the general idea all right so now it says about symbolic execution that this can be ex effectively used for exercising different execution of the program and that is what i mentioned so it says uh, that uh, reachability and infection problems for logic based testing again it says logic based because you know it all revolves around conditions right and conditional statements so therefore it is still within the realm of logic based testing and it can be solved by symbolic execution again because we don't know right what input would actually cause some specific line of the program to reach you know the program to reach that so for example if we know that okay 
I wish to reach uh, so and so line number. Let's say I wish to uh, reach line number 36. Then I, I don't know, like, what is the initial input that I need to provide? In certain cases, it might be obvious. But you know, as the program grows, it is not um, always very clear what kind of input would actually cause because there are uh, state changes that are happening, right? So the initial input that you provide to the program, it changes as it, as the program goes through. And so the final thing might be different, right? I mean, if you know the internal state, that whatever input you provide, it, it, it takes on different forms, right? So you don't know how do you reach, right? And, and that problem is what? Uh, Symbolic execution is trying to solve. Okay, so with that in mind, we'll go forward. So these are some of the uh, you know uh, academic references uh, about the uh, research uh, on symbolic execution. So one may go through this if one wishes to go through that, but it is okay for the discussion of uh, I mean like for today's discussion, it is not as important, but we might uh, look at that you know uh, if required. All right, so this is the example program that we are going to be following throughout, uh, at least for this, I think, a significant portion of this discussion for today. And uh, so we have to understand it carefully. So there is this method that we are going to be testing. This is what we are interested in. So this is this uh, pseudocode, basically. So therefore, there is no uh, signature as such. It's all pseudocode. It says uh, there's a sum method. We understand what it does. So there are three parameters you know, that it is taking E, B, and C. Right, and what it is doing, so these are all line numbers, one, two, three, four, up to six, and X is A plus B, Y is B plus C, Z is uh, X plus Y minus B, whatever uh, operations it is performing on the inputs, and then finally it is going to return Z, okay, or Z, and then the program ends, okay. So, see what happens. Uh, normal execution of programs on inputs, so these are the inputs for A and B and C respectively that we are giving, right? And we see what happens, uh, you know, after each ex state statement gets executed, and that is what I mentioned in my uh, introduction. So, you know, dip, uh, when you give the input, right, it changes. In the internal state, it might be something different, uh, you know, uh, as it as it flows through the execution path of the program. So, for example, in statement one, so what was statement one? Statement one was the signature itself, the call itself, right? So A comma B comma C. And that is the call. So we are just providing uh, 135. So that remains as it is because in the call itself, nothing is happening. No transformation or operation is taking place. And therefore, uh, it is as it is. Now, if I come to statement two, uh, you see what happens. So this is question mark. Now, question mark denotes that these variables are not yet defined because we are at the call, right? We are at the call of the sum function. At this moment, we are not into it i mean like we are not into the uh the body of the function basically this part onwards right because x get de uh, gets defined only at two right so unless you go inside of this function no x and y and z are not ex uh, existing at, at that um, moment and therefore uh, at one it is like question mark because we don't have it yeah so after statement two uh, not what happens so this uh, dash basically represents whatever it was so just carried over okay so y is question mark here Z is again question mark. A is one, B is three, C is five here also. So please read it as such. Okay. However, for X the value changes. So we are only noting down the changes here. So in after statement two is executed, the value of X goes to four, and that indeed is the case because one three five is there. So uh, one plus three basically, you know, this is one plus three, and therefore you get uh, four here. Similarly, we go to three, and then we see that Y gets eight. Y gets eight because we have B plus C, right? So what is B plus C is three plus five, that, that gives us eight. And similarly for four, we have Z is equal to uh, X plus Y minus B, which is going to be uh, 12 minus five. Uh, uh, isn't it 12? So eight uh, X plus five is 12 and then minus uh, B, sorry. So this this would be minus three. And that gives us nine. And uh, in, the, in the fifth line, uh, the last line, basically we are returning that. So that is, uh, what is the final output is going to be so that is returns nine so this is the normal execution one execution given an input a set of inputs rather for the variables a b c respectively this is this is how the execution is going to be okay in the above table uh, question mark represents undefined variables as i mentioned because when you were calling initially x and y and z were not in scope as we call it 
and therefore it was all question mark uh, as we move forward it all takes uh, their own respective values you know all right so uh, we'll move forward here now see this is the normal execution right so what happens i was mentioning about the uh, the normal uh, the regular testing technique so in that we have a test case so let's say this is a test case let's let's assume that the test case input rather so we are providing it and this is how it goes now contrast this with symbolic execution so this was a normal execution in symbolic execution what happens is that instead of providing a concrete value we say it concrete and symbolic so symbolic is symbolic as you see here and concrete is one any one value that is there so in this case it was concrete 135 and in this case it is symbolic so what we do in symbolic execution is that instead of providing actual concrete value for the variables that are inputs to my function or method whatever i'm going to test for i denote them using symbolic variables okay so for instance i'll just zoom in it says that it's the same thing right as previous it's just that instead of providing 135 here i'm calling a is getting the value alpha 1 b is getting the value alpha 2 and C is getting the value alpha 3. OK, I'll come to what PC is. All right, and the rest of the execution remains the same, right? It's just that we are not getting the final output. It is all uh, in terms of expression, symbolic expressions, right? So it is like X was because X was, uh, you know, uh, A plus B. So it is getting alpha 1 plus alpha 2. So you can think of it as placeholder values that we are taking here. All right, and similarly, it goes on. So finally, uh, Z, uh, Z has this value, so alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3. So it is because, uh, if you see here again, coming back, we have, uh, so this is alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, so it is going to be, you know, uh, okay, we have to expand it. Uh, X becomes alpha 1 plus alpha 2, and then Y becomes uh, alpha 2 plus uh, alpha 3, and then we subtract it, right? So basically, alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3 remain. And basically, you can write it down in an expanded form. You'll see that it will cancel out, basically. You know, whatever is extra, it will get canceled out. And this is what you uh, get at the end. So it is just a symbolic representation of what is going to be returned from this particular function. OK? So this is a symbolic execution, uh, representation of a symbolic execution of the method sum. And herein, we don't have a concrete input. No, in the earlier case, we had a concrete input. 1 comma 3 comma 5 in this case we have alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha 3 respectively for the variables a b and c and pc here is the path constraint so i'll see i'll come to what path constraint is and why it is true in the first case for that i think we will we'll need a little bit uh, more discussion uh, so it'll all become uh, clear as we move forward for now i just assume that uh, this is a condition basically you know uh, such that if it is true we'll go forward otherwise we'll not go forward and therefore in the first case it is true because how, how do we Enter then no because this was the first statement like in this case it was sum right so here so if the path condition here itself is false then I'll not not go inside of it so therefore the first PC path constraint always is true it is like a it is like a constant so it always has to be true therefore you go inside right so that that is why it is true and and when it changes I'll come to that okay so this is the path condition in the in this simple case for this simple method okay. Now, this is a different example. It's a slightly involved example, but it's the same thing. Same thing happens here. So this is uh, two two functions are here. So one function is the twice function. Uh, that basically whatever v you are providing, it is going to return twice of v as it is. And this also is a function. I think there's a, a parenthesis is missing here, but it's okay. So we're taking x and y. And z is basically twice of y. So whatever y you provided, no, that is going in. So basically it will become twice of y, right? So z is equal to twice of y. It all it is all symbolic, right? So z is equal to twice of y, and you know, and then it is a condition. So now now uh, these path conditions will become important. Herein it says at line number six that if z or z is equal to is equal to x, then only you go inside of this particular block. Otherwise you will not go. Of course that is how if statements work, right? So that is okay. Okay, and this is the driver code. So I mean like this was the these were the two methods that are there in the program. And this is the main function, right? So as you all know, when the program is started, it is starts with the main function, right? It is called the entry point for the program. OK, so because we are not having concrete input, recall in this case, because we are doing symbolic execution over this program, so we are not providing anything to x. It is not like 10, 3, something like that. 
is just symbolic input. So we can just assume it is something, right? Alpha one, alpha two, so on and so forth. So we have uh, x as symbolic input, y is also a symbolic input, and then we are calling the method test me because we are interested in testing this particular fragment of code, this method, uh, so, you know, and therefore we are calling the method test me on this symbolic input that that is there, right? So x comma y. When that ends, we are just going to return zero, but that is not of significance for this discussion. Uh, we are only concerned with the test me method here because we are uh, interested in testing this particular thing. So all right. So what happens is that okay. Now uh, what happens is that you know. Uh, so this was like a concrete. Uh, this is just a side by side comparison of what happens. So in the concrete case, it is two, for example, right? So two one two. In the symbolic state, it is just denoted at uh, x uh, not y not, right? Uh, similar to what happened in the earlier case, alpha one alpha two was there. In this case, we are taking it x not and y not. So that's okay. So then z is equal to twice of y not. Why is that case? Why is that the case? Because it is all from the program, right? Remember, we said z is equal to twice of y. So y was what? Why we have provided the symbolic input y not, right? So y not goes into twice, so twice of y not. So when it is twice of y not, what is going to be written? It is go uh, going to return two into y not because it is y not basically, you know? The symbolic representation then becomes y not. So twice of y not is going to be returned from this particular function and that gets assigned to z. So therefore, uh, z is equal to twice of y not, okay? Now here, here are the path constraints. Okay, so what happens is that these these were the you know symbolic state and these were the path constraints. So what what are all path constraints that we are having? So it is all depending on the condition. So path constraints are depending on the condition, as I said. No. So if it is true, then you go inside this path. You follow this path. If it is not true, then you don't follow, right? So there are two conditions, as you can see. One condition is this, right? This one. This one is z is equal to is equal to x. And since we know in symbolic execution, symbolic representation, we have z is equal to uh, twice of y naught, right? As 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 mentioned here. Therefore, the condition becomes twice of y naught is equal to is equal to x naught, and that is the same thing, because x is equal to x naught, and therefore z is equal to twice of y naught. So therefore, the whole condition or path condition or path constraints become uh, two into uh, uh, y naught is equal to is equal to x naught, and that is what we uh, get here. As one of the path conditions, the other is, of course, uh, the one which is below that. So it is, uh, you know, x greater than uh, y plus ten. Uh, so you know, x greater than y plus ten is another uh, condition. I think there is a typo here. It it should be x greater than only because you have mentioned here only, right? Uh, in this case, it is greater than. So it should be greater than according to the whatever the code says, right? And this is x naught. So I think there is a typo here. Should be x naught greater than y naught plus ten, and that is exactly what the condition is here. Only represented symbolically, right? So that is what the uh, thing is. So now, the idea, recall uh, what I mentioned in the introduction, is that uh, if we know that we have to reach a particular statement in the program, now if we ourselves are making the test cases, we are not sure of how exactly the the input that I'm going to provide, what path, what execution path is it is going to take. So or will I reach my error or not? And therefore reachability comes into the picture right so i want to reach this code sorry this 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 line right line number 8 so how do i reach that i don't know it in advance so that is what symbolic execution is helping us with okay so it is saying that you got this condition with you because you know it is all this uh, path condition that will get me there because see if this condition is true assuming this first if block it is true then if it is if at the same time if, if this uh, other condition is also true Right, then I'll reach my error statement. The objective is to reach that line number eight. And therefore, I see that when this thing becomes true, this is the predicate form, the same thing, right? So basically, the outer if statement was having this. The inner if statement is basically this, x not uh, greater than y not plus 10. And if you have and, right, because it's a nested if, right? So you'll go line number eight only if the outer if is true and the inner if is true, then only you go inside, right? Otherwise, if the outer if is false, then you'll not go inside of this one itself. So there is no question of checking this one, right? So it, it has to be true the first one, line number six, and then seven has to be true also, and then you go inside, and therefore this is and, right? So it all depends on the condition. So because the condition is such that it is nested, you have to have an and there. It is all intuitive. In case there are questions, you may please ask. So basically, the first condition is this. The other one is this. Yeah, go ahead, please. Whoever is asking. Yeah, uh, it's me, Rahul. So yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, for this one, um, is there any significance of writing the uh, second path condition at the bottom? I mean, 
is it somehow related to the third line i, I don't think no 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 this is just uh, the table uh -huh. representation this is the yeah. conditions of yeah. that particular uh, um, you know if yeah, yeah. or whatever okay. yeah yeah yeah, yeah, I mean, like this table is just for representational purposes. It's not having any significance at this moment. As you go forward, you'll see that uh, how so it is. Concrete actually. state is basically the real values, and symbolic state is the one yeah. in the code. True, true. And the concrete state is also, I mean, as given here, is just for illustrative uh, purposes. It is not having any significance. The the values are not having any significance as of now. But when we'll, when we'll get to the discussion no, about giving any inputs, I mean, that becomes relevant, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And then we'll go to concolic testing also, no? moving concolic forward. There, there we'll see uh, how it becomes relevant. For now, it is not of, of significance. I mean, it is only about the symbolic state and, of course, the path constraint. No? Okay. So, uh, and now if you go One back. More thing. Hmm, yeah, please. One more thing on that table, if you can go back there. Yep. Uh, so the uh, line written at the bottom, solve the path condition, blah, 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 to this get one. a solution, which it essentially means in order to get the error, those two things have to be true and therefore the intersection right true true i mean that that basically your path constraint if you are able to solve that somehow and we'll get to how do we solve it like mm -hmm. i mean like i don't know right <laughs> how do we solve it so if i were able to solve it somehow then i mm -hmm. know that i'll reach my error because these are the conditions right so if i satisfy those, yeah, yeah. So satisfy yeah. those and, and i'll okay. get there so the idea basically that uh symbolic execution is allowing you to to help you in is basically to reach you know therefore reachability Hmm. And subsequently, infection also. And that, about that, I think we'll discuss in detail when we come to mutation testing going forward. So reachability and infection is what uh, symbolic execution is helping you with. Because it allows you to basically get the exact input for which you'll satisfy certain path constraints and thereby follow as exact path in, in your execution of your program, which otherwise it is difficult to you know, come up with, right? Depending on whatever conditions that's there. Right, of course. I mean, like this was a toy example for illustration. So it is, I mean, like we might as well come up with this uh, using, uh, I mean, like trial and error. But of mm -hmm. course, you can imagine uh, that for larger programs and larger code fragments, if you have to check, and there are so many interdependencies between these things, then mm -hmm. it obviously becomes a lot more tedious to do that by hand, right? Mm -hmm. So we need some, some kind of a automated way of doing it. And therefore, we have this. Mm -hmm. I hope the, the idea is clear. Yeah, the idea is clear. Yeah. Right. yeah, sure. Thank you. So and now once we have this uh, uh, path condition with us, right, we can come up with something called as a symbolic execution tree. OK, so this is how it looks like. All right. And and in this case, we have uh, tried out to every. Basically, that is what we do. So whatever path conditions you have, and therefore, I think we mentioned it directly. I mean, the order is not having any significance. But I mean, like order is having a significance, in fact, in the tree. I mean, because because see, this this condition is only coming into the picture only when you have this thing as true, right? Otherwise, it is not there. So therefore, you see that this part is coming only on the right of this. Because only one uh, once it is true, no, the outer outer if condition, then only you go inside and then you encounter this this condition. Otherwise, you don't get it at all, right? So therefore, so see what happens. We are just doing a uh, basically an exhaustive kind of uh, valuation over this, whatever conditions we have. So we start with this. Why do we start with this? It's because the code starts with this. This is the first thing that you get, right? Z is equal to Z equal to X, and that is what we start with. Okay, and this is all the symbolic nature. So it is like twice of, you know, you know what that is, right? So Z is equal to twice of Y naught, and then Z is equal to X naught, and so on. So when it is false, what happens? Okay, so when it is false, uh, basically, nothing, after that, nothing is there, right? So if if the condition at line number six itself is false, then basically the method will come out of the method, right? There is nothing more to do. And in fact, if we come out of the method, we'll come here, line number 14 in the main method. And then after that, basically there is a return. So it doesn't really do anything after that. So that is what, uh, and the way to read it is uh, slightly different. So I'll come to that. The other case, think about it. So the other case is that when it is true, right? So when it is true, something more happens, which was not happening in the other case when it was false. What else happens is that we go into that branch. Now, this is a different path, so to speak. And if you, if you can connect with the CFG, uh, the structural graph uh, representation also, that will help you. So when this is true, I'm taking a different branch, you know, so to speak. And of course, that is what happening. That is what is happening. So we have this as true. So in that case, we can have, we'll get to this condition. Now, this condition independently might be true or false also, line number seven, right? So therefore, we are checking for uh, both cases for this particular condition also. So this is like, you know, this is one path. So for example, you start from here, uh, true, false is one path. So we have x is equal to two, y is equal to one. So what this is saying then is that 
basically uh, once you trace this no you get the path condition as we were getting in this case so this is one of the path conditions right in this case both need to be true so that this path condition becomes true because this is an and right in between however in this case like this uh, first one is true the other one is false uh, in this case like the uh, left branch of the uh, of the right branch of the first condition i mean basically this one right so in this case the first one need to be true the next one need to be false and and one such uh, input is this it is saying that once we get that path condition uh, you know for this particular path then if we solve it one possible input so that this path conditions are satisfied is this and you can substitute and see that it will indeed pass satisfy so for example <coughs> sorry so for example you have uh, x is equal to 2 right so this becomes 2 and y is 1 so 2 into 1 is 2 is equal to is equal to 2 and that becomes true so you come this side instead of going this side you come here it is true and then you substitute again the same values so x is 2 y is 1 and 1 plus 10 is 11 and you see that 2 greater than 11 is false and therefore you come here i mean like not you you don't come here basically it is just to represent it is saying that when you give this input you will follow this path and end up here okay otherwise one more possible input is this so if you give that you will reach the error so in this case both conditions are true are there any questions at this point yeah, so so Afnan, uh, the question I had I had raised with you in the morning. Mm. Uh, this is the actual same problem as in the practice assignment. Okay, the nested if. Okay. Now, okay. how many nodes are there in this graph? Uh, I see. That I can see are, only two. There are five. No? I mean, like, okay, we are including this one. I think also. I mean, that's not a node. That is a test case. Yeah, that is a test case that will satisfy that that condition. No, first of all, the answer that was given in the practice assignment is 8. There is oh. no way it can be 8. For this one, is it? Yeah. OK. OK, we'll have to check that. Uh, can can we take that at the end, Anand, if possible? Yeah, uh, yeah sure, sure. Uh, yeah, okay. OK. OK, we'll go over that and then see. So apparently, there are multiple ways by which one can construct a symbolic execution tree. And, and therefore, subsequently, the number of nodes that you get, uh, uh, those will be different. Those can vary. And therefore, we had decided earlier that uh specifically the exact number of nodes the questions pertaining to that at least in the quizzes won't be asked so so therefore that ambiguity arises but we'll come to that i have something some examples uh, of different variants of the symbolic execution tree and that perhaps i can demonstrate today uh to get a okay. better idea of what is going on but yeah okay, okay. Uh, i'll come to that for sure all right so uh, the other case is of course when this is true and this is true similar to how we got this one in the earlier slide this one right so this is basically the same thing if if both are true right then uh, one such possible uh, input would be this and then you can again substitute and see that it is indeed satisfying so for example if x is 30 uh, y is 15 then of course twice into 15 is getting 30 is equal to is equal to 30 and that is true and then you come here you see that x is 30 and this is 15 so it is 25 so 30 greater than 25 is true and therefore you, you basically reach there the, the the upshot is that you are going to get the error um, you know statement that you, you you wanted to reach so this one you know so the objective that symbolic execution was intended to uh, you know uh, complete it is actually doing that so our objective was to reach that particular error statement even if we don't know what the input should be, we are able to get to that. And, and how do we then get these things? Once we have the, I understand that, okay, path conditions are there, but how are we getting these things is what we'll come to next. Okay, slight digression here from what we are discussing today, but it is important for the uh, context of what we are discussing. Therefore, I'll go over this briefly. So, uh, notice that one discussion that has been happening uh, since the very beginning of this course I mentioned on the earlier sessions also that the idea of test cases that we have in the usual testing technique that we have what do we do there right so you have a program you want to test that right and to test that you come up with test cases now what are test cases test cases are basically test inputs that you yourself are uh, coming up with you are designing test cases and one of the objectives uh, of this course is also to design you to uh, I mean, like to teach you to how to design 
good test cases better test cases you know for for testing your programs but that is okay so you are doing it and then along with that test input is one thing along with that you have expected output also right what do you expect so if i know that okay i'm going to provide this input then i expect my program to give me this kind of output or or this output then i have this expected output and then we match it right we see whether the actual output is equal to the expected output or not if that is equal then we'll say that the test case has passed if it is not equal then we say that the test case has failed so it is all revolving around the actual output and the expected output okay but one intricacy that one might overlook in the beginning is that you know it never proves that your program is actually correct now <laughs> why is that can anyone point out one reason why test cases are not enough to basically say that your program is actually correct any pointers in the direction there could be corner cases which are not considered mm, yeah 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 that, that is true so corner cases is one very good point that anand asked about uh, mentioned that uh, you know we are not because we are doing it ourselves right i mean in some sense so we don't know right what might happen and the other thing is that you know uh the input space and, and for input space also we'll come to i um, mean the coming weeks week eight i think there's this uh, input space partitioning that delves into these topics also but in the input space you know thinking about it it's very vast right so you cannot anticipate everything that might come into your program especially as, as it grows bigger right there's so many variants that are possible so many things that is happening right how can you come up with the exhaustive set of test cases is never possible that is one part part of it and and you know what uh, even if you come up let's say uh, you know for the sake of this argument that you are able to in fact come up with the exhaustive set of test cases but then your program is also evolving right then it might be the case that your test cases are, are no longer sufficient there are other cases which you are not covering for and therefore you know and perhaps the older test cases are no longer relevant so all these questions are there so therefore it is all manual and you know you don't know uh, whether it is going to always work or not right so <clears throat> that is one thing however the program proving is a is a different kind of technique altogether as it is mentioned it's a formal method as in it is akin to what we do in mathematical proofs okay so we are trying to prove here you know rigorously that whatever programs i have written it is actually going to work as intended and i'm giving you a proof for that it is similar to proving mathematical you know uh, uh, theories okay so similar to this we do that but in practice however uh, program proving cannot be used extensively for everything right for example uh, if you have a very large program it might not always be feasible in fact to prove it everything i mean like everything cannot be proved and therefore we have to fall back to again you know the test cases method and you know you have to design test cases and test based on that because we cannot do it um, why why we cannot do it i think will will become clear uh, as we move forward but yeah that is what it is so yeah exactly so that is what i mentioned it says this is different from testing where a program is tested only against a set of test cases so now your test cases set of test cases is very like it depends right i mean we don't know we cannot say so for example if the test cases but if there are no failures would you say that your program is fully correct it is not now there is no such proof right so it depends right how how good your test cases are so let's say you have you have a number of test cases but none of them are useful in terms of testing then then it is you know it is all passing but still you have errors in your program right so then in that case it is not useful right so again same thing it is mentioning that test cases are not exhaustive and in fact exhaustive testing is never possible is not possible because let's say talk about integers right so it is not possible to give all integers right because integers are infinite how do i do exhaustive testing on that yeah right so to tackle with that there is something called input space partitioning also uh, that we are going to discuss in week 8 so that is not for now but yeah basically the idea is that program proving is basically proving it formally and uh, because of the fact that test cases are not, not exhaustive but again program proving also cannot be used everywhere and therefore we have to have a middle way uh, in between the two things and therefore we are discussing them yeah so formal methods are basically you know mathematical techniques that are based on deriving formal models from programmer system and, <coughs> and then we are checking based on that so it's similar to how we do um, you know mathematical proofs so we will not go into much detail of this but this is what it is 
Okay, so yeah, it is saying that uh, program testing and program proving can be considered as extreme alternatives. So on one side, you have you are just providing concrete inputs and saying that okay, if this is working, then my program is working. On the other hand, you are saying that no, I need a formal proof saying that my program is correct. Then only I'll I'll say that it is correct. So both are in some sense extremes, right? So and that is what it says here also. So what we are trying to do next, uh, as in symbolic execution and its uh, uh, other uh, evolved versions, like for example the concolic testing and Dart and so on, is basically trying to get a get to a middle way in between the two. It is not like fully proving or not uh, coming up with manually coming up with test cases. It's like a middle way in between the two. Okay. Yeah, it's the same thing. Basically, it is repeating. Yeah, again, so it is saying one more important point is that whatever is not in the sample, as in for whatever inputs you have not tested for, how do you know that the program is correct, right? So same thing. And again, it, it is very tedious, if not impossible, to come up with every kind of input that you might, your program might get. And that is even for one, one, you know, one version, let's say, for your program. If it evolves, if the logic changes, new features are being added, right? Then you cannot keep doing it forever, right? And so I mean, like, it is not practical. Right, in program proving, it happens that we are trying to check or prove the specification of the program itself of the correct behavior of the program without executing. So similar to what we do in mathematical proofs. Okay. Now, one more thing is that not all proofs can be automated. So it is difficult to automate because we have to, we have to have, you know, all these derivations and stuff, which is not uh, at least uh, till today fully automated. And therefore, it needs to be done by hand also. And therefore, it is tedious. So you cannot have an automated way of program proving if 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 that had exist uh, i mean like if if that had been uh, there had been such a thing then it would have been very easy but again so because you have to do it by hand it is difficult so again so yeah that is like a practical approach that is what i mentioned so symbol execution is a practical approach between the two extremes of testing and proving so you are trying to do some kind of automation like okay so till now i was coming up with test cases manually no, I don't know my inputs are valid or not. And then again, reachability becomes a very difficult thing to do, right? You don't know what is going to happen. So what, I, what I'm going to put in, I don't know what is the program, uh, what is the path that the program is going to follow. And if I want to reproduce that, let's say I want to follow the exact same path for other, other inputs, you know, see uh, if the behavior is changing and so on and so forth. It is all very difficult because uh, we don't know in some sense which test cases are close enough. If you think about it that way, right? So if there are two test cases. One might lead to an entirely different pro uh, execution path in the program, and the other might lead into, uh, you know, in, into an entirely different path. So they are not close enough, right? Even though the the so-called change in the input is little, you might end up following a completely different path, right? So there is no way to measure, right? How how do I know how do I know which test is similar to what test? You know, it is. There is no way to to say as of now. And that is one that is one thing that you want to see if we can do something about that. So again, as uh, we have discussed uh, while describing the examples, uh, the testing technique that executes a program symbolically for a set of inputs instead of a sample input, as in concrete inputs. So instead of being concrete, we have symbolic execution, which is uh, doing it symbolically, as we have seen in the examples. So one very nice uh, outcome of this is that if you do one symbolic execution, then basically you are doing an equivalent of a large number of normal test cases. because it Basically, if you think about it for a minute, what it says is that you are symbolically testing instead of uh, instead of providing a concrete value. So then, whatever input so forth is going to follow that exact exact same path in the execution uh, flow of the program, then that is covered for right. So it is like you know whatever inputs are going to satisfy those path conditions that I derived. If 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 there there exists another test uh, input concrete input such that it satisfies the same path condition, then my path is going to be the same. Then I need not test for that. If I check it once, then it is covering for the other ones also. If I am going to follow the same path, right? So therefore, I need not check for the other ones, and therefore, it is covering for a large number of normal test cases. I hope this point is clear, uh, important because I mean this point is clear because this point is important, so it needs to be clear. Are there any questions at this point? Or shall we go forward? All right, I'm assuming it's OK. We are going forward now. So it is all describing it, uh, whatever we have discussed so far you know, in, in these texts. So it is saying that it is using symbolic values instead of concrete data values. <coughs> and you know, program variables are represented as symbolic expressions over the symbolic input values. Again, the 
the expressions that we are making as the program uh, goes through different statements these uh, symbolic ex expressions are being uh, symbolic uh, expressions are being created so we are collecting all those we'll see uh, moving forward what happens okay all right so hence the output values computed by a program are expressed as a function of the symbolic input values as we have seen in the first case no alpha 1 plus z is equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus uh, alpha 3 now that was the return value right the output value so in some sense if you're having symbolic values all uh, all over the place then basically the output of your method or function of your program is going to be a function of those input symbolic input values and that is a very nice thing you'll see why okay uh, symbolic okay so some some uh, conventions here symbolic state is repre represented by the sigma symbol it's a map okay so it is basically mapping variables variables to their symbolic expressions so that is one thing we'll see example for that and the path constraints again uh, we've discussed about this pc is a you know first order uh, formula again the same thing as the uh, propositions right so as we discussed in the uh, week 5 also the logic and all so it says symbolic execution is used to generate a test input for each execution path of the program as we have seen in the example. So execution path, now note that one intricacy here is that execution path then becomes a sequence of trues and false, right? As we have seen in the symbolic execution tree, if you want to go back, I can go back also. So for example, if I quickly go back here. So for example, if I, if I talk about this path, which is leading to an error, which was my objective, then in that case, uh, the path is true, true, right? I mean, it's a sequence, so it's a one first and because it is all you know sequential. So one condition it is true, the other condition it is true. Then I reach here. If it is true and this is false, then I reach the other 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 part of the program, whatever it may be. This is not the program, but these are the inputs such that this path is followed. So what it is basically saying is that your path conditions are basically one execution path rather of the program is basically a sequence of true and false values as we can see here right so if you have a false to start with you end up here whatever right so this is what it says now we'll come back uh okay here we were so execution path then it becomes a sequence of true and false where true respectively false the ith position in the sequence denotes the ith conditional statement in contrary along the execution path took the then uh, branch right so if it is false then we go to the else part of it Right. If it is true, then we go to the then part. Then, as in, we go inside. If it is not true, uh, typically uh, that is how uh, if a statement works. So, if it is not true, we go to the else part, right? And CFG also the same thing happens. So, one condition you take this path, the other condition you take the other path. So that is how it works. And again, the execution tree, uh, as was described, there. symbolic uh, execution tree as execution tree is the same thing. All right, so what happens when you are doing symbolic execution formally is that we initialize the path. Sorry, what I'm saying, the the map, OK, the the state map. And, and that is like an empty map because we don't have anything to begin with. Right now, every time we read a statement, right, the symbolic execution is going to add mapping. Like, let's say we are we were talking, right, that x is going to be x naught, y is going to be y naught, a, for example, is going to be alpha 1, b is going to be alpha 2 c is going to be alpha 3 right so that mapping no that needs to be there because how do we know which variable it is talking about so that mapping needs to be there and it is being so how do we go about it so as and when we read the statements you have seen in the very initial table that uh, that i described in this in this class right so that table you know it was going statement by statement so in the one statement you have some some symbolic uh, values the other statement you have something right similarly it, it keeps on building up the map okay and every statement, whenever assignment happens, new assignment, like whatever the previous value for the variable was, it, it gets assigned a new value. Then basically you update it, right? Whatever the ex new expression is, you just do that. I mean, like you, if it is, let's say, if it is a nested if, then you and it, right? Because we know that if you're going inside, then it must be an and, both conditions need to be true. If it is a or, then you put a or there, whatever the conditions may be, you accordingly put it and map it, okay? to that particular uh, <coughs> expression okay so this is the uh, example so therefore that is what i said in the table also we've seen that that in the beginning of the symbolic execution the path constraint is going to be true always because we have to start right if the path condition in the beginning itself becomes false then we are not going to follow forward uh, you know we are not going to go forward and therefore uh, 
I mean, it doesn't make sense. So the first one needs to be true always. And therefore, in the very first table, we've seen that the PC was true initially. So that is always the case. Okay. Now what happens? See, this is all uh, describing the same thing. So if we reach a conditional statement, if inside of that there is an expression E, then you execute statement one, else ex statement two. That is a general format, right? So PC is updated to PC and whatever the current uh, current mapping is for that particular expression. You end it because you're going in, right? If 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 that is true, we are talking about the case when it is true. So it is going to follow the then branch, and then you have uh, again. So what it does basically now symbolic execution. What it is doing at each conditional statement, it is generating two path constraints simultaneously. This part is very important. Please understand that. Okay. So we were seeing it only for the one one sided case, right? So if you want to reach the error, what do we do? That is okay. But if you do, if you're doing it systematically. Then what it basically does is that it makes it true. I mean, like whatever it follows it, the true case, and it negates it, whatever the condition is at each at each uh, conditional statement. It also negates it and also generates the path constraint for the other case. So that is called PC prime. So for example, if I am saying that this 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 one is for the then branch, then I also do a negation over that to generate the other side of it also, and that is very easy then, right? I I, I can follow the other case also. So I did not know how to go there. I negate it. I get the other case. Okay. And if I solve that, then I also get a concrete value, uh, concrete valued input for the other case also. So one case I had this path con condition. I solve it. You know, I, I get the, I get the concrete values. I negate that path condition, and I solve it. I get the uh, input for the other case also. So that is a very nice thing, right? You are getting it automatically when you are able to solve that. Right, so therefore, at each conditional statement, basically, it is generating two path condition or constraints, PC and PC prime. Okay, and that is what PC prime is not of whatever. So you know, it keeps on following, following, following. When you reach a particular state, so if you want to uh, do for the true case, you do just do and. If you want to generate for the false case, you negate it. Whatever the current expression is, you negate it. Whatever the if statement expression is saying, you negate it, and you get the else branch also because that is of course how it is working. Okay, I hope this part is clear. And okay, so if the path constraint, or for that matter, path constraint, the negation of that, or PC prime, I'm calling it PC prime. If PC or PC prime is satisfiable for some assignment, I'll come to what satisfiability is, and some assignment is. So I mean, like we will come to this. Some assignment of concrete values, so concrete to symbolic values, then symbolic execution continues along the then branch with this. Uh, with this so for example i reach a particular condition okay think about it for a minute i reach a particular condition in my program i have my path conditions till then till then till that point okay till that line i have that now it may be the case that that condition is not satisfiable at all right for example if you have uh, let's say a is equal to true and a is equal to false i mean at the same time it cannot be true and therefore one example one very basic example of unsatisfiable condition right it cannot be the case that a and not a cannot become true right at all so therefore it's an unsatisfiable condition for example there might be other conditions also but i'm just giving one example so if it is unsatisfiable then of course you cannot have concrete values for that it's not possible right it is not satisfiable so we cannot go the then part then we cannot go inside of it right i mean because the condition itself is unsatisfiable so we not go that path we just go the negation of that so not of that so we go the other other side and that is what it says. If it is satisfiable, then we'll continue. Then, you know, if, if it is not satisfiable, then we'll not continue. Basically, okay. And it says, unlike concrete execution, both branches can be uh, taken, resulting in two execution paths. Huh? That is one more thing. So it says that in concrete execution, we had one concrete value, one set of values for the variables we have, input variables. I give that. I follow one path. That is all. I get the output. In this case. I can follow both, right? Because at, the, at, at every juncture, at every conditional statement, I am basically generating two conditions. One, when I take the then part, I go inside. And the other, when I don't go inside, so that is the else part. So I negate it, I get the other, other case. So in this case, I, I am following, I'm able to follow both branches, right? So that is a nice thing, which is not there in, in concrete execution, for example. Again, so if PC or PC prime is not satisfiable, uh, then of course, uh, we, we cannot move forward right basically because we are in a dead end basically so uh, if it is not satisfiable how do we go inside right so we end there but that's okay 
now uh, so far we have been talking about this path condition and all and then we are saying that somehow we we'll solve that right <laughs> and get the concrete because until unless we get uh, we get the concrete values it is of no use right how do how do i get my test cases then if i don't have any concrete values i cannot get it so therefore uh, what we use is called a constraint solver uh, to generate it so so far i just followed through my code collected all the conditions generated the respective path conditions for the true case as well as for the fa false case so i have all these things with me then i pass it along to a constra constraint solver to actually give me some concrete input value such that those path conditions are satisfied now if i have that i know that if i am going to put in that as my input then as a normal test case then i know that my path is going to be that i'm going to follow that path exactly and precisely so that is the idea okay so the constraint solver is actually doing most of the job here once i have that condition i pass it along to that and it basically gives me back concrete values now and i can put that and i am i'm assured that i'm going to follow the same path which was not the case when you were coming up with test cases manually right so that is one nice thing about it okay so and the next part is symbolic execution can also be terminated if the program hits an exit or error basically you know because the objective then would be reached either you exit the program or an error occurs so either way you can terminate i mean say similar things happen in test cases also right so if the assertion becomes false or the test case is not passing or 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 else if it is passing either way you just stop it right so i mean like if you reach an error symbolic execution can stop too right exactly this is the point that i was highlighting and this is very important so if the program is executed on these concrete input values whichever you get out of the constraint solver that is going to take exactly the same path as the symbolic execution and terminate in the same way so this is like a guarantee right uh, so, Afna, uh, yeah can can i interrupt yeah so, please ab about the previous statement you made mm -hmm. the symbolic execution can also be terminated if the program hits uh, an exit mm -hmm. or an error right mm -hmm. so um so this uh, this when, when you say an error actually what what error do you mean because the error can actually be part of the program as well ah okay, okay. you're talking about error, error failure and all those things right yeah yeah so you, <laughs> no. in one of the programs you have right. given uh -huh. i mean you have shown in the slides itself uh -huh. says you have to reach an error right so you don't you don't actually get out of the symbolic once you reach that right you still you will still continue uh most of the cases see our objective would be reachability right as i mentioned earlier because uh, all, all this we are doing to reach reach right reach the portion we want to reach so i mean it might as well be an error or not an error basically i designate one place that okay i want to i want to go here right i'm i'm, I'm having a particular kind of assertion there or something right i want to reach that and uh, i can reach that so it need not be an error but typically it, it is a error so so reach error statement erroneous statement basically it is not like so it is, is, yeah. is it not better to say uh, reach the designated part reach the part you want to reach right so right because, right yeah because you can you can have multiple exceptions multiple things True. that can happen True. so i mean i ask because there is an assignment question around this so okay. it was okay. quite confusing for me okay. right right uh, we'll discuss it possible uh, that's okay yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. here what it is saying so see there are two things one is that what we want to reach so we can basically reach anything right uh, by now you might have realized that wherever i want to reach i can reach given that i know the path conditions that is one the other thing it is saying in a different way it is not saying that if you reach your designated uh, whatever uh, statement is you can terminate of course you can terminate because you reach your destination so you can terminate it is saying that if i am not able to reach also and you know there is some abrupt error that happens then also it can be terminated right in between so i was i was trying to reach somewhere but it so happened that i got an exception somehow and i basically the program failed right so it might also happen i might not always reach my destination also it is possible okay. right okay yeah so so in that case it is i think same okay yeah. but it is okay i mean like your point is also well taken i understand so it, there is one uh, there needs to be one uh, clause saying that we can basically whatever uh, we want to reach we reach so possibly because we are always designating that that statement we want to reach as error only therefore we are calling it error but it might as well okay. be something else right so uh, that is okay that i understand yeah got it thanks uh, thank you and if the program is yeah so this this part right this part is even more important so if the program is executed then on these concrete input values that i get on uh, to repeat to out of the constraint solver then i'm going to get the same path that is a very nice thing because i get reproducibility then right 
I know that this is exactly going to be the, the path. So this is very helpful, right, in testing. Because I know that, OK, if I fix my logic, assuming that there was some error, right, I know, OK, if I, if I put in this values, then that is going to be the path. And therefore, I get this error. Let me fix this. I fix this. I put the same thing again. I get that, OK, this error is fixed. So this is very nice in, in that aspect, right? OK. Now, these concrete inputs ensure that coverage is achieved in testing by taking different execution paths. So the idea, the, the, the overall idea is not even about reaching a specific portion. What it is trying to say it is like the, the, the ambition in some sense is about uh, doing all the different execution paths <laughs> that are possible. Right? So in some sense, you're trying to get close to whatever program proving was trying to do, right? So if you are able to somehow exercise all different paths, assuming of your program, then in some sense, you have a, got a really good confidence saying that, uh, you know, I've tested it, right, quite uh, exhaustively in, in some sense, right? So that is what. So you take different execution paths. You try to do it for all of them. However, in practice, it might not be possible to test for all execution paths. Please keep that in mind. However, basically, the, the, the general idea is somewhat uh, in the same direction that if I'm able to exercise all paths, then basically, in some sense, uh, I'm I'm getting close to proving also, right? In in fact, because I know that okay, this class of input is going to follow this path, and this class of input is following, going to follow this path. Then if I <laughs> do do it for everything that is possible, then basically I've tested it throughout, right? So that is what it is. All right, so it is going to run the same input as I described in the very beginning. And we are going it systematically now, one by one, what is happening. So after line 12, 13, we have the symbolic states. X is mapped to X naught. This all should be implicit now. I'm not going to too much detail. Y is Y naught. And X naught and Y naught are two initially unconstrained symbolic values because we are just starting, right? There's no constraint. So we are talking about line 12 and 13 here because we know we start from here. This is the main method. The entry point, we go, go in, we just take in something, some assignment happens, right? So. This x naught y naught respectively. This is the mapping. Okay, line five it gets <laughs> gets updated. X naught remains x naught y naught remains y naught z. However, becomes twice of y naught because okay z was even not there previously. So here it was not. It's a new thing that gets added and it gets assigned to twice of y naught because you may be able to realize that we are at line five right. So z is equal to z is getting defined also. No? So it's defined and the value is of course twice of y naught. Because twice the function twice got to return uh, twice of whatever we provide, so twice of y naught, and therefore z gets mapped to twice of y naught. So this part must be clear. And uh, line six, two instances of symbolic execution are created. Now again, so that is what I said. Once I reach a conditional statement, I create two path constraints. One is when I go inside; the other when the negation, basically. So I mean, it depends. Whatever condition you have, you negate it. You get the other other thing, right? The two two possibilities are there only, right? Either it is true or false. So if you are if you are able to get it for true, then you negate it. You get it for false. So in this case, if uh, it is z is equal to is equal to x, then I negate this particular path condition, whatever I get at line six. I get the other case when I don't follow this path. Okay, the other case. So like the if you if you connect it with the CFG, that is what it happen. Uh, what it is doing. So if you follow in the one case, the other case you don't follow. Okay. So if it is and the other case, if it is z is e not is equal to x, let's say let's, let's assume that this particular condition is z is e not is equal to x, right? So then in that case, if I negate, I get the other case. So either way, it is working, right? My basic idea is to uh, get whatever constraints are there, right? So I do that, okay? So I basically uh, add this line number six. I have this, and I negate it. I get the other one, okay? So two instances of symbolic execution are created. Now one intricacy that one needs to Hmm. Note here is that, uh, yeah, one intricacy that one needs to note here is that if x not not is equal to twice of y not condition happens, this one, the one that I have highlighted, in that case, you don't go to check the next condition, right? Because the branch, the, the execution path is different in that case. You go come up here, line number nine. You don't go inside, right? So we don't encounter this condition then in that case, right? And the, then we don't see it basically. So this doesn't get mapped. Therefore, in this case, you don't have anything else. I mean, I mean, like you just have this condition. That is all. However, when it is true, then you get one more condition. For that, also you generate two path conditions. So one, when it when it is true, by true it is uh, by true it it means x not greater than y not plus n. This is the actual condition, and then we negate it. So negation becomes 
less than equal to right the negation of this thing is basically less than equal to okay so you get two conditions however note that it, it is it is only in the case when x is uh, x not is equal to twice of y not because then only this condition comes into the picture right be it false or true either way this needs to be true right so therefore we are ending it because then then only you get it right you get inside and then you see this condition so you generate two path conditions for this this particular if statement and and if it is this one x not not is equal to twice of y not then you don't see this one and therefore you don't have it. so in, in total you have three conditions only three path con conditions only and therefore you solve each of them all the three and then you for example there might be other other inputs which are also satisfying these kinds of uh, equations these kinds of uh, predicates but on uh, the constraint solver for example might give us something like this so one case we have uh, x is equal to zero y is equal to one the other case x is equal to two y is equal to one and the other case this one so these are the three uh, solved uh, values that we are we are getting for these path conditions as seen in the symbolic execution tree only so this is the same thing actually that that is the one which we saw in the uh, tree also so basically once we have these conditions right so this is the condition one two this one and three three conditions we solve this we get this okay i hope this is clear we just systematically ran through the example that i described earlier now there's one more thing left uh, uh, that is there after that i think con colleague testing will be there so this is regarding loops before that is are there any questions Okay, I'm assuming it's okay going forward. Uh, okay, so one one thing that we didn't discuss uh, how about what about loops? So we, loops were not there, right? In the examples that we saw, loops were not there. So we have to think about them also. So let's consider a very simple example. This is a test me <coughs> example, and this is INF is basically infinity. So that is telling us something. It is saying that see what is happening. It's a while loop, right? So we are taking input, right? So this is a user. Um, you know user defined input or or for example it's a symbolic input that we are getting so it might be the system might be giving something you know to it so integer some some ram, random input is coming in while x uh, sorry while n is greater than zero we are summing it whatever value we get for it we are accumulating that so that is a very basic thing and then once we add it we ask for another input right so it is changing so in that sense it is never going to terminate right until unless of course uh, your input your n becomes zero then only it is going to terminate otherwise it will keep on going so how do we formulate this in in a predicate how do we do that because we don't know when to end right so that is one thing okay so that is what we'll discuss here it says the loop in the example three has an infinite number of execution paths because you can keep on going forever right so it is something like that so it says each execution path is either a sequence of arbitrary number of truths because you keep on going inside and inside keep following the while loop Followed by was or a sequence of infinite number of truths. Okay, so what we do to to get around this this problem is that how many ever times we want to go inside, it is similar to what we do, right? Uh, in, you might relate it with the uh, structural graph coverage criteria also. So what do we do there is that you know how many ever times we want to loop, we just keep on going forever <laughs> in that loop, right? I mean, do twice or thrice and so on. So something similar we are doing here. We're saying that. How many ever times I want to go inside n number of truths? That is what it's saying. Right? This is the general formulation for a predicate path condition, right? For a loop. Okay, that so that that is what happens. Okay, so I'm saying that I want to go in n times, n truths. Want to satisfy n times. So go in n times. Basically, follow the loop n times. So what I'm doing is that I'm doing an and operation. So this is and, right? Similar and that we've seen earlier. This and logic and for i. Right, belonging to one to n. So for all n inputs that I'm going to, uh, I want to, I want it be it to be true. I'll I'll constrain that. My constraint would be that the input n i because n i is what the condition is here, right? This one. This is the condition, right? So I want n times. I want to follow it n times, small n times. I want to follow it small n times. I want it to be true. So from one to small n, right? I want n i to be greater than zero because that is what lead me, leads me. Inside the loop, I want to go inside, right? So that many times I'll go inside. So it is all and, right? So n one greater than zero, and n two greater than zero, and n three greater than zero, so on up to n sub n greater than zero. And then finally, 
how many ever times you want it to be true because you have to exit otherwise you'll keep going on forever right so you need a way to exit and therefore we constrain it we say that okay i want to let's say take a typical value five times three times two times i want to follow it okay and then finally to end with the n plus one time i mandatorily give a false condition that is the negation of however i get inside so i get inside by doing this n greater than zero if i want to don't follow it so i have to negate it right the other other case right so it's a not of this thing so the not of uh, n greater than zero would be uh, n less than equal to zero and that is the n plus one condition then would be this one so if i and this all together this is all and right all and it together so if i and it then i get exactly the same thing so i will get how many ever times i want to follow the loop and then exit the loop also so this is how a general formulation looks like is this part clear are there any questions in this i'm assuming it's okay uh Shall I go forward? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Anil. All right. So yeah, that that is what. So it says uh, basically that each each n i is basically a fresh uh, fresh value, basically a new value, right? Because every time you're getting it, right? Every time you're getting a new one, right? So when I go in, I automatically get a new one. So it's like if it was n one, I get n two, right? And so on. So how many ever times I want to go in? Finally, it says about the symbolic state. So remember. we've talk about the symbolic state the sigma right and it keeps collecting the values it keeps mapping right so it keeps updating right as and when the variables change the value uh, the variables change basically because there is no concrete value here so it will not be right to say value values but basically the mapping state so if if they change we keep updating the symbolic state and therefore at the end of the execution you might realize that n would be holding the n the last value right whatever was caused me to get outside the loop right that was the last thing so n times i i went in the last time i did not go in so therefore the last thing uh, so the the value for n would be the last one at the end of the execution that is what it is asking for and the sum of course the sum variable because you had sum only right two things were there sum and this sum and n so two things were there sum of course <coughs> of course would be the summation of how many ever n i's you were you were having right so each time you are getting a new n i right so the sum of all such n i's would be the final sum and that is what the symbolic state looks like at the end of the execution of this particular loop okay so these were the two things okay so a couple of things to note here uh, it says in general symbolic execution of code containing loops or recursion may result in an infinite number of paths right if the termination condition that is what i mentioned earlier right if this false is not there at the end right it has to be there right because how do we know when to exit we have other things to check also right so you have to exit this loop so therefore uh, it's a general convention of course i mean it's rather uh, the correct formulation is to always at the end uh, you know append a false condition so that you get out of the loop and that is what it is mentioning here if the termination condition uh, for the loop you know is symbolic because it is symbolic we don't know i mean like how, how do we know when to end so we need to uh, negate that the last one and uh, end that because if you are having concrete values right because then we know right if if i know that okay uh i i need to go three times if the input is three integer three then it'll 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 uh, you know go through three times and then exit of course right so we understand but in this case it is not the case because it is all symbolic so how do we ensure that it must exit right so that is where the false condition is helping us it is helping us to get out of the loop okay so that is one thing in practice one needs to put a limit on the search a time out or a limit on the number of path or loop iterations or exploration that how many ever times you want to keep following you know some kind of limit must be there if 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 the first condition is not there let's say then you might as well have a time out or something like that right that okay after this period of time i'll, I'll end uh, you know the program the execution uh, symbolic execution or something like that right so we can do that and of course so several other programming concerns need to be handled to develop a practical symbolic execution tool so what it says is that we have seen so far the normal case the conditional statements you've seen the while loops right so this is the while loop for loop i think i can imagine it will be similar only right something similar because for loop also has a similar structure so there are other things also switch case you know other such things are there so for that also we'll have to come up with other kinds of constructs i mean the 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 path condition uh, representation of the those programming constructs also okay so we can have that 
later on. So I mean, it is not discussed here, but it's okay. Okay, so we talked about the constraint solver. So uh, a couple of things about that. Let's say symbolic testing. Now, now we might imagine that it is dependent on a constraint solver, right? Of course, because I get my path conditions again, and I have to solve that to actually get the concrete value. That will then become my uh, test inputs for the test cases. Okay, so that is it. Uh, okay, so therefore uh, I need a solver. So the thing is uh, that input values are solutions. So when I am able to come up with solutions such that that constraint is solved, and by solved I mean it becomes true. So what a constraint solver's job is to you know come up with values, give you concrete values such that whatever condition you provide, it can be any condition, right? So if I want to say it's like solving linear equations, but it is a different thing. And I'm just giving an example. So if you have an equation, you want to get solutions to that such that it is satisfied, right? The similar thing is happening here. We have a constraint solver. Its job is to, given a condition, find me a, a concrete value such that the condition I have given, the constraint I have given, must be satisfied. So that is that. And the the general problem in computer science uh, of solving such constraints, not only this, not only in testing, in general, uh, any given any predicate, if I want to find values such that that predicate is satisfied, is known as the satisfiability problem, and that turns out to be NP complete. Okay, so that is uh, for those who are aware. Uh, if from algorithms class, if you remember, there are two classes of problems generally. I mean, there are other classes, but in general, there are two uh, classes. Most famous, uh, so that is like polynomial time and non-deterministic polynomial, right? So basically, uh, uh, to to state it simply, on a classical computer that is not quantum, uh, the computer that we are having today, uh, if we are able to, if if we had to uh, write an algorithm such that these kinds of problems are solved, for example, satisfiability or any any NP complete example uh, problem, for example, then that needs to take at least exponential time in the number of inputs, so two power n. Because why? Because I can have a brute force algorithm for this, right? I have how many ever clauses I have. I just keep doing true, false, true, false, true, false until until unless I come up with a solution which is uh, satisfying the given condition, right? So I'll say my I found my solution. So one brute force way is to you know construct the entire truth table and from that see what is what is uh, giving me true. But that is then exponential, right? Because we know given n such variables, we'll have two power n possible combinations. Right, so it is not feasible, right? In general, so what it says basically, NP-complete problem says that even for computers, they are difficult to solve because most of the algorithms, all of the algorithms for these kinds of problems are basically brute force and uh, exponentially hard. So it is like NP-hard or NP-complete problems. Okay, there. However, how, how does then the constraint solver work? Constraint solvers are actually working uh, using heuristics. There are several heuristics by which they are able to speed up the process. Okay, it is not that we are having an algorithm such that in general it can solve for any problem. It is not the case. However, these days, uh, due to the developments in this area, we are having very good constraint solvers actually, which can actually solve for a very very large number of constraints in a very uh, reasonable amount of time. You know, uh, and, and that can give us concrete values such that those constraints are satisfied. Okay, so that is possible. But in general, it is stated that it's an NP-complete problem, and therefore we don't have a con uh, algorithm even today such that it is solved in polynomial time, for instance. right? Uh, the only thing is, of course, the brute force way. But brute force way is un invisible. And therefore, uh, we have to use heuristics. OK? So there are tricks, basically, by which they speed up the process and therefore get to a solution. So I mean, like for software testing, at least uh, these work very well. And therefore, it is used in practice also. OK, now one more thing is that uh, so far, I've been talking about this constraint and satisfiability. So now th there might be there are two things to it. First is that I know I have a formula or a predicate, so I want to come up with a solution for it. So one is the practicality of it, right? For example, whether I'm a, or not I'm able to uh, solve it, like technical constraint that I'm having because I'm not having a good algorithm or or I mean like we don't know if if can we solve easily. So it might take time, right? Because it is NP complete, NP hard, exponential time. You know, it might take time. So that is one thing, right? So we cannot say it might be that it is very large such that it is infeasible even for constraint solvers these days to solve. It might happen, right, in certain cases. So therefore, you'll say that okay, this is impractical for me. I have to test. I cannot wait for so long, of course, right. So I mean, that is one one thing. The other thing is it might not as well be solvable at all. Like for example, it is not about the solver, as in the condition itself is unsatisfiable. So for example, the uh, the earlier example that I gave, A and not A. 
right? It cannot be solved, right? At the same time, both A and not A cannot be true, right? So that is like un. So it is. It is then the constraint solver would actually say that this is not satisfiable. It is unsatisfiable. So it is a solution then because we know, right? The constraint solver's job is to either give us a solution or say that it is not satisfied, not satisfiable. So either of them works, but the technical difficulty, on the other hand, is that it is uh, even for computers it is difficult. But yeah. Again, for practical purposes, there are good constraints solver which can do a very good job and therefore is used in practice also. Okay, now again, so that is what it says. Consequently, if the path constraint generated during a symbolic execution contains formula that cannot be efficiently, therefore efficiently is there in bracket, it might have a solution, but it is very large and you know it is taking so much time to solve even my constraint solvers. Then how do I get to my concrete inputs? And if I don't get to con concrete inputs, I cannot have my test inputs. If I don't have te test inputs, then of course, uh, I cannot have test cases. So of course, you might imagine that this is one of the disadvantages. The only For example, if for a large number of problems, it is uh, you know easily solvable, and therefore, we use it in practice. But however, uh, as a key disadvantage, it, it is mentioned that if it so happens that we are not able to solve it efficiently, you know, due to various reasons, then of course uh, we cannot use symbolic testing there, and we have to come across. I mean, handle this. Uh, so, Afnan, uh, here let me can I interrupt? Yeah, please. Yeah. So this was the other question that I had. Uh, so there was a question on the disadvantages of symbolic testing. And uh, one of the items there was, uh, of course, this what we discussed just now, the efficient solving of using constraint solver. Mm. But uh, isn't the path, uh, a lot of paths also can be a disadvantage, right? So path explosion. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah. Why, so, is, why is that? I mean, I, I'm, I'm just trying to clarify that mm. question uh, that for that particular option is not selected. It's not the right answer. Too, too many so, paths, is it? Yeah, so that is uh, I mean, not the right answer. <laughs> I understand, but too many yeah. paths is subjective, right? I mean, how, how do we quantify that? It is how not really subjective, right? So path explosion is a. I mean, so I was watching a YouTube video. I mean, uh, in that one, he says it definitely is a problem, and it it looks to me that is a problem as well. Even in this slide, actually, it's mentioned hmm. the a lot of paths. If if you have too many paths. Path constraints, you mean? For example, if you if you have a loop, for example. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, in that sense, right? yeah. Hmm. It can be a huge number of uh, paths, and there can be a lot of paths in that. In that, yeah, yeah, makes sense. That, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean uh, see, that is true theoretically, but in practice, what happens? You know, we have this false condition also. Speaking of loops, so we know that right, that if I run it three times, then that will be sufficient. So let it run three times only, and then I'll have that false, which will get me out of this uh, infinite loop. Right. So I, I mean, like in practice, I don't see uh, it became becoming a bottleneck as such. But yeah, of course, theoretically speaking, we have an infinite number of paths. Of course, you cannot do this. It's something like complete path coverage in in symbolic. Uh, sorry, in the structural graph coverage criteria also. No, complete right. co right. path coverage is not possible due to the same reason. Right. <laughs> we can keep on going. So therefore, it is not efficient. And, and same thing. Same thing applies here also. But of course, practically speaking, we have a limit. And therefore, it says earlier that. Uh, here uh, in practice one needs to put a limit on the search yeah. of course i mean the many number of paths as you said are problematic if you don't have such a limit theoretically we are not discussing it but of course in practice you have to have such such limits so that the exploration depth uh, is, is limited so we don't keep on going forever right so that is one does that okay. answer it somewhat uh, yeah, it, it answers it, but I, I was uh, more of from the context of the questions. I yeah, was, definitely. Uh, so we'll go over that. Don't worry about <laughs> it. Okay. We'll yeah, sure. Uh, okay. So again, yeah, with that in mind, I'll go over that question and see if, if, if we can reframe that if possible. I understand that there might be ambiguities, so it's okay. Uh, we'll take that up. Uh, again, so it is uh, decided in detail. So one thing was, again, as we've seen that uh, if the PC or PC prime, whatever it might be, or PC, for example. I mean, in general, you want to go, right? You want to keep following. So, assuming that both PC and PC prime are not solvable, then in that case, we cannot continue, and therefore, we come to a halt, right? So that is one of the disadvantages, as we discussed. The other, perhaps more practical, to me, disadvantage is that uh, the underlying program that we are going to test, 
right the code itself is not available that that the whole thing is not with you think about client server applications so what happens there so we cannot continue until we have something right we, we don't know what will, what is going to happen so i call an api that is residing or somewhere else on the cloud some server i don't know what it, that that function is doing it's all black box for me it just gives me an output and i continue but uh, the output uh, recall that it basically a concrete output no but the, the the other program is not aware of the fact that we are doing symbolic execution here so how do we call that right so if the underlying program the whole function the whole thing is not there with you then how do i solve the pc because we don't know what the pc is going to be because we don't have the function so it's a visibility issue right we, we don't have it we don't have the code right so that is more practical we'll see how to mitigate this one in particular uh, going forward and that is what con colic is about con colic testing is about this this specific disadvantage okay again so same thing many real life programs have huge number of program paths i think that is what uh, anand was raising uh, resulting in several path constraints exploring all paths might not might be in, in impossible and feasible and therefore the idea of limit comes in right so i mean uh, put a limit on that but we'll see that question also okay all right so this is about the symbolic execution modern day i mean basically i mentioned that modern day uh, solvers can actually do handle uh, hundreds of thousands of variables and there is this different arithmetic operations also and therefore it is still practical to at least give you some test cases no it is not that we are not saying that we are going to all, go all in on symbolic execution only but uh, you know it, it is it is going to help you a lot right because it will give you a lot lot of test cases wherever it is applicable so it is very nice in, in that aspect right so that is one the computers can also process data faster and have more memory these days because because of the you know better specifications that computers are having technical specifications the smt solvers are by nature you know uh, improving also and there are of course research that is going on in satisfiability problem in general there's a whole lot of research going on on improving sat solvers and and stuff of that sort because these are these are the things which are very general right so this is applicable in software testing however in operations research and you know traffic planning and other such things in general you know airline and stuff you see that these things are very helpful so if the sat solvers in general can be improved that is going to have an impact on a lot of other practical applications that we have in, we have for that right so it it helps a lot Again, several techniques are able to alleviate the disadvantages and generate templates using symbolic testing, specifically uh, this one. And in fact, to some extent, uh, this one also, the path constraint. So, both of these things we'll see in concolic testing. I'm not sure if I'll be able to cover it today. Maybe concolic testing, we can go forward the next live session. However, if there are any specific questions, we can take that and discuss that for today. This is Dart or concolic testing. So this we might as well discuss later on. Would that be okay? Okay, so I'm assuming it's fine. I'll just uh, come back now. Stop sharing. All right, so we can stop the live streaming also if you're there.